So uh, I am Srijan, and uh, together with uh, Christos, we'll be presenting uh, this particular tutorial on uh, modeling malicious behavior uh, on uh, online uh, social networks. And uh, unfortunately, two of our co-presenters could not make it uh, because of visa issues. So uh, I'll be presenting. Uh, I'm Srijan, and I'll be presenting the part before the break, and Christos will be presenting the part after the break. So um, let's get started. So essentially, web is a space for all where anyone can read, publish, and share information. Uh, it enables social interaction. It's no longer a place where people go and passively browse content, but instead, it is a very active and dynamic platform where people interact with each other. They generate content in real time. They are uh, very much. Uh, uh, there are several different platforms where uh, people interact uh, to generate content, uh, like. Uh, 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 like uh, you have Wikipedia pages, you have uh, different bookmarking websites and so on. And uh, pe uh, people are not only the consumers, but are also producers so, uh, of this content. And this has led to a lot of different uh, opportunities. Like uh, pe uh, anyone can express uh, their opinions, anyone can contribute towards the content. And this means there are lots of different ways in which you can mine this particular data and get uh, insights into human behavior, marketing analytics, and uh, product sentiment, and many, many more things. So just to give one and two, uh, one or two quick examples, uh, the rise of social media led to a very, uh, very abrupt, but very uh, well-needed uh, rise of uh, real-time citizen journalism, which means people were able to convey their own information and whatever uh, and say whatever they wanted, but also specifically on uh, particular new uh, about some real-time events, and uh, they uh, that led to a lot of uh, help in, uh, for example, in the Mumbai uh, attacks uh, where. Uh, uh, the news was first generated from uh, from people tweeting about that particular event. Uh, but the, uh, there's also a challenge. There are so many people generating so much content. How do you actually uh, wade through the, so many hundreds and mil, uh, hundreds and thousands of posts in a short uh, amount of time? Uh, but uh, this is very important, and the goal is to mine this in real time to uh, develop insights and uh, find the knowledge in this, uh, from this in real time and produce well-organized uh, summaries. Uh, another uh, very good application of all uh, all of this is reputation management. Everyone likes to express opinion about other people or uh, or some other particular uh, products and other content. And uh, this leads to uh, areas like uh, consumer brand analytics, marketing communication, you get uh, product reviews, and so on. But there's also a dark side to the web. Not everyone has good intentions. Oh. Um, and this, uh, this happens because anyone can use uh, as many identities as they want on the social web. Uh, they can put whatever they want. They can put it uh, from wherever. And they can also remove it or change it to whenever they want to. So um, for example, uh, the um, trolls ruin the internet. There are Wikipedia sock puppets and bots that create uh, fake Wikipedia pages and uh, create fake content. Uh, internet is uh, not very safe for women. And fake news and fake reviews are, uh, are everywhere, and uh, they are growing day by day. And uh, in fact, uh, as shown by Pew, uh, Pew Research in 2014, 40% of the people have reported that they have personally been harassed by someone else on the social media. Um, that's a huge number. And uh, when you uh, look at, um, and um, in the same research, they said uh, at least 70% of the people have uh, known someone else who has been harassed. So the uh, harassment is very, very common in social media and in the social web. And um, re very recent research at uh, CSCW um, by uh, Justin Cheng, Michael Bernstein, Christian Danescu, Nicholas Q. Mizzle, and Ural Eskovic showed that uh, uh, malicious behavior is con uh, contagious. So if you see someone else uh, doing something bad, you will uh, you will also do you'll also be encouraged to do something bad. So in this particular uh, table, what we see is that now uh, so this uh, was done as a mechanical Turk. So this particular slide is from a mechanical Turk experiment where uh, people were uh, given a task to to just interact with other people in a very simulated environment. Uh, but the interactions were with other real people. And uh, the posts that a user would go and see 
uh, posts that were already positive or negative and uh, they uh, people could also get uh, have positive mood or negative mood based on what they had seen before so based on that you uh, what you see here is that just even if uh, the mood of the person is the same just seeing negative context that previously exists you see that there's an increase in the percentage of trolling posts than the people uh, that the people give and just looking at uh, and when uh, with negative mood it increases even more so negative mood and negative context gives the um, brings out the worst from everyone but just looking at the negative uh, just looking at the effect of context of what people have already seen in that particular uh, uh, instance that increases the trolling behavior and uh, this was a very nice study and uh, it's it's very deep uh, like i'm not going into the details of what mood is but essentially uh, in just one quick line they um, they gave very hard quiz uh, quiz to people and uh, they performed bad so that reduced their mood they may, uh, the mood became negative and uh, people were given easy quizzes and they were uh, given uh, they were shown appreciative uh, words so uh, their mood became positive and they tested out uh, tested that out as well so essentially the takeaway from this slide is that malicious behavior if you see someone else being malicious you yourself are very likely to behave maliciously as well and uh, this problem of malicious behavior is further uh, was and by the present um, due to anonymity uh, the very aptly summarized by this meme uh, way back in 1990s uh, where uh, you could be a dog sitting on a computer and typing something and no one would know um, and uh, this malicious behavior has a very harmful uh, online as well as offline uh, impact it leads to distress harassment it uh, leads to offline delinquent behavior and in some uh, cases it has also led to fatalities and um, not just malicious behavior there are also fake news and fake reviews on the web and everything is uh, not everything that you see on the web is actually true uh, for example in 20, 2011 several uh, facebook posts appeared saying that jackie chan is dead and uh, um, jackie chan had to release a personal statement saying that hey guys i'm not actually dead i'm i'm alive and i'm uh, working on my movies uh, same thing happened with morgan freeman on uh, in 2010 and the news was uh, said to have come from cnn and cnn had to uh, report that uh, no uh, we did not actually uh, report that morgan freeman is dead and uh, the uh, the reason for why misinformation is so particularly uh, uh, spread so uh, so quickly in social media is because people trust any content that was uh, that comes from their friends rather than actually checking what the content is they trust uh, their friends and this particular um, slides shows that uh, 70% of the people get their news from facebook friends seventy uh, percent of the people who use Facebook get their news from friends and only thirteen percent from journalists. Situation is a little bit better on Twitter where you get twenty seven percent of the news from journalists and news organizations but thirty six percent of the news is uh, is still you are getting from um, from friends and family so um, given that we rely so much on social interaction and uh, there is so much misinformation and malicious behavior online. In this tutorial we'll be looking at modeling and detecting this malicious behavior and there are several challenges that we'll need to address so the first is data imbalance uh, most of the people on uh, on the web are actually good and their intentions are not bad and uh, there's only a small proportion of uh, users that are usually uh, usually malicious and this is usually less than 10% uh we have uh, limited labels uh, we don't know all the types of malicious behavior that exists online and uh, even in most uh, even for the cases that we know not all the not all the types uh, not all the malicious uh, entities are known and uh, finally malicious behavior and malicious users can be very deceptive uh, they tend to masquerade themselves as benign users and misinformation tends to um, masquerade itself as uh, benign information and this leads uh, to a lot of confusion and this is what malicious users and information use to uh, to hide themselves so the goal of this tutorial is to uh, to look at a uh, at several case studies and uh, lots of different algorithms to identify Uh, malicious behavior and uh, and malicious content and uh, 
from the entire tutorial of three uh, three hours, the overarching takeaway is that malicious user malicious behavior and benign behavior are both different and uh, uh, in terms of their properties as well as in terms of their connectivity with other uh, other entities uh, on the network and these uh, these differences can be leveraged to identify which behavior is good and which behavior is not so this will be the outline of uh, of the talk and the slides are available uh, in this uh, particular link very short link uh, you can go there and see, uh, um, follow along with the slides. And um, uh, it's probably in the bottom of this website. So uh, this will be the outline of our talk. Uh, the introduction, which I just gave, then uh, the, uh, the, tech the technical content is divided into three different parts. Uh, we have feature-based algorithms. We'll have uh, spectral-based algorithms and density-based algorithms. In feature-based algorithms, we'll be looking at uh, uh, different types of malicious entities like sock puppets, vandals, and hoaxes. In spectral, we'll be uh, looking at uh, how do you visualize, how do you identify, and how do you visualize different uh, types of uh, malicious behavior like spokes, blocks, and staircases. And uh, we'll be looking at um, uh, camouflaging. And then uh, in density base, we'll be looking at uh, uh, fake likes and fake reviews, um, uh, synchronized behaviors, advertising content, ad advertising com campaigns, and social spam. spam. Uh, let's start with the feature-based uh, um, feature-based algorithms. So uh, discussion platforms are uh, everywhere, and they are an integral part of uh, social web and uh, communication. So uh, dis uh, discussion platforms lead to uh, people expressing their ideas, opinion, and information about other uh, content and other people. For example, on Wikipedia, editors uh, discuss about what pages to edit and how to edit that. On Amazon, people discuss about what pages, uh, uh, what products they have uh, uh, purchased and what products they want to buy. On CNN, people discuss about news events and so on. Uh, for example, on, uh, on one website called IGN, there's an article called uh, um, on uh, why DC Comics is better than Marvel Comics. And due to uh, discussions, you see some people saying uh, why, uh, why they agree with this article and some people saying why they disagree with this particular article. And uh, even though uh, there are uh, people discussing, some people create multiple identities or fake identities called sock puppets uh, to turn discussions in their favor. And uh, in, this, in the same example, uh, in the same uh, web page, uh, a user named BD-209 said, this is probably the best blog I've ever, uh, I've ever read. To which Eric17, which is uh, the same guy who has written this particular uh, blog, says, thanks, I knew uh, the, the Marvel fans would try to flame me, and so on. Turns out BD-209 and Eric17 are sock puppets of the same um, user, and BD-209 has been created so that uh, it can post in the same thread multiple times and, uh, and support whatever uh, Eric17 is saying. And this was noticed by other people, and uh, one of them said, quick talking to yourself, get back on your meds if you're going to do that. And these examples, I've not made this up, this happened in real, and uh, these examples are everywhere. So, and, uh, and sock puppetry is very, very common. On Amazon, uh, sock puppets are used to create fake reviews. On, uh, you know, on Yahoo News, uh, there, was, uh, uh, there was this particular web uh, news. And uh, on uh, Wikipedia, sock puppets are created to create uh, fake, uh, fake articles. Uh, the biggest case of Wikipedia sock puppetry was on uh, uh, was when more than uh, about 400 fake accounts was created and operated by a single organization, and they uh, they edited and also created more than 250 articles. And this is the social network. If you uh, if you look at all the people, uh, all the accounts. Uh, so I think yellow ones are the accounts uh, created by uh, by the sock puppet. Um, and the green ones are the normal accounts that edited the same pages as uh, as the sock puppet. So, um, based on uh, based on surveys and uh, um, 
Based on surveys, uh, several studies have shown uh, and tried to investigate why stock puppetry happens. So uh, in this, um, the, and there are multiple reasons. So stock puppets have been identified to be created to diversify their identity. So you want to explore with different types of identities. You want to anonymize yourself. You don't want uh, some particular thing associated back to your main account, for example. You want to multiply. Uh, you want to multiply your identity so can so that you can push the same agenda. And there are sometimes legitimate or private uh, privacy concerns uh, due to which you have to create multiple accounts and operate them. These are all different types of sock puppetry. And on Wikipedia specifically, there are uh, specific legitimate use cases. For example, uh, security, privacy getting a clean start you do, um, you want a new life essentially and uh, and so on and there are lots of different uh, alternate uh, um, there are lots of inappropriate reasons of why people can be uh, banned for using sock puppets and uh, the um, for uh, specifically on wikipedia the good thing is that most of the data is public so a lot of uh, research has been done on identifying sock puppets on wikipedia and um, the way sock puppets are identified is that people suspect people uh, who act as volunteers suspect that these are uh, sock puppets and uh, they flag them and then administrators go and manually verify these accounts and uh, see whether they are actually uh, uh, sock puppets and if they are they are confirmed and deleted and whenever uh, that happens this notice comes on saying that hey you are uh, suspected of using a sock puppet and then eventually the account will be banned and there's a lot of research on uh, how wikipedia sock puppets operate and how wikipedia sock puppets are used um, and the way um, we, uh, sock puppets are identified not only on wikipedia but also in social platforms is uh, is by using different types of heuristics. For example, in uh, in a paper on frontiers of uh, computer uh, computer science in 2016, uh, sock puppets were defined by using uh, similar login time. Uh, they had similar IP addresses, and sock puppets were assumed to have similar usernames. Um, this other paper was uh, defined sock puppets as uh, two accounts that had the same point of view and uh, they were writing very similar to each other in terms of uh, um, no, their uh, content. And uh, this another uh, one other paper defines sock puppets as accounts being operated by the same person and they are supporting each other. So all of these definitions are good, but they lack. Uh, they make some assumptions that may or may not be true in the real world. For example. Uh, this paper assumes that sock puppets are always uh, using similar names. Uh, this paper assumes that sock puppet uh, sock puppets are using have a similar point of view, and uh, uh, this assumption is about uh, whether they are always supporting each other or not. Um, so, in this particular uh, case study that we'll be looking at is about uh, sock puppets and on online discussions, and uh, this was uh, in the World Wide Web conference uh, um, a few months ago. And here uh, we looked at data from uh, from Discuss, which is a commenting widget that can be plugged into any uh, any platform, and it enables social communication. And uh, we looked at data for uh, from over 2.9 million users. Uh, made that made over 62 million posts and um, it spanned lots of different uh, um, platforms like uh, news websites sport websites uh, technology uh, um, movies and so on and the way we define so uh, sock puppets is based on how people are uh, interacting uh, how accounts are interacting with each other and how um, whether um, what is their IP address, which is very hard to um, hard to manipulate. So uh, our definition uh, is the following. So uh, we define sock puppets as uh, accounts that post from the same IP address very close in time, and uh, they do it um, at least a few number of times so that we have less false positives. And you see that uh, there are some some parameters here that do not that uh, we still need to plug in. So the way we do that is to look at uh, several properties of the sock puppet uh, of the accounts that are identified by plugging in different values of T and K in here and uh, generating all the possible combinations of sock puppets. And for example, uh, if you look at different values of K, 
you uh, and plot what is the difference of uh, the length of post between the two accounts that are identified as sock puppets what you see is that uh, you get two curves. One is for ordinary pair of users that do not satisfy this definition for this value of k, which uh, which is denoted by this blue line. And you get uh, sock puppets that are, that satisfy this definition, and that is by the red line. So the first, so this particular uh, property, difference in length of post, is a common property that has been identified by multiple of these uh, existing works on how sock puppets actually write. And based on that, what you see here is that sock puppet pairs are, uh, first of all, irrespective of what value of k is chosen, sock puppet pairs are always uh, similar in how they write. So uh, they have very similar, their difference in length of post is uh, very less as compared to ordinary users. And at k equals to 3, you, you get the difference to be the minimum. So, uh, and if we draw a similar plot for um, for t, which is the time difference, uh, um, which is the time difference when two sock puppet accounts are uh, posting, we get uh, the minimum at t equals 15. So based on this, our definition now becomes um, sock puppets are accounts that are uh, that post from the same IP address very close in time, which is uh, at most 15 minutes apart from each other at least three different times. So this gives us very few false positives and a lot of uh, sock puppet accounts, uh, which was a total of uh, a, a little more than 3,500 sock puppet accounts being operated by over 1,600 puppet masters. So puppet masters are the operators uh, that are using these multiple sock puppet accounts and 3,600 sock puppet accounts were, uh, were identified. So based on this definition of sock puppetry, on uh, uh, that is uh, that uses the behavior and uh, uses immutable things like IP address. We now look at uh, how these sock puppet accounts are actually uh, operating. So, but to do that, we we have to identify non sock puppet account users that are very similar in property, so that we don't have uh, bias in uh, in selection. So, to, um, what we do is for each sock puppet account, we find a non-sock puppet account or an ordinary account that makes similar number of posts and uh, always uh, and also operates on similar discussions. So the intuition behind this is uh, we, uh, there may be prop, uh, there may be differences in how sock puppets and normal accounts behave in terms of uh, how many posts they make and which communicate uh, which discussions they participate in. To and to remove those uh, factors, we select these uh, non-sock puppet accounts from uh, uh, that uh, that have similar number of posts and make similar uh, make these posts on similar discussions. Six five six sock puppets and three six five six non-sock puppets. One uh, one non-sock puppet for each sock puppet. And uh, the first thing we see is that sock puppets are usually posting in very um, very active and controversial topics like uh, USA, world, politics, justice, and opinion. While non-sock puppets, uh, uh, while uh, uh, they are not very active on topics like uh, tech, sports, travel, which are uh, which are essentially not as controversial as these other um, other topics. And this was uh, based on uh, where sock puppets were posting in in CNN in particular. Um, Looking at how sock puppets write and how they differ from non-sock puppets and uh, how they're writing. So consider uh, this particular thread. What we see here is that uh, sock puppets usually do not start discussions. They are uh, mostly right, um, they are replying to other non-sock puppet users or other sock puppet users. Um, and they are usually writing shorter sentences as compared to non-sock puppets. They write more self-centered posts, so they use a lot of uh, eyes. And they also address others uh, very free, uh, directly. So they also use a lot of uh, the word you. And they agree. They tend to uh, agree more, which is surprising because uh, in this case, for example, this uh, user is replying to a non-sock puppet user, but uh, sock puppets in general tend to agree more to reduce uh, controversiality. But they're eventually identified and uh, um, they are found and downvoted by other users. In terms of uh, how two sock puppets that are being uh, used by the same person, how they are interacting with each other, what we see is that uh, if 
this, uh, these two accounts are sock puppets uh, by the same person. What we see is that sock puppets interact with each other a lot more compared to the, the matching pair of ordinary users that we have. And they upvote uh, each other a lot. So the, uh, this user would upvote the comments made by this particular sock puppet and this sock puppet would upvote um, this particular uh, user's sock puppet. But uh, how do we, uh, what is the purpose of this sock puppet creation and how are the puppet masters, which are the people behind the sock puppet, uh, using these different sock puppets, right? Um, so one hypothesis is that the puppet masters are very smart and they behave the two sock puppet accounts very differently. So which means one sock puppet account is very close and indistinguishable from an ordinary user and the other sock puppet account is uh, very far in terms of its similarity to the uh, to the sock puppet where similarity is measured based on how uh, based on the cosine similarity of all the posts that mm, the users have made and uh, we derive a lot of features like loop content sentiment uh, number of words and so on to identify uh, similarity so we develop a feature vector of uh, ordinary users we develop feature vectors of the sock puppet and of the sock puppet and then compare uh, make pairwise uh, cosine similarity um, to do that. So the first hypothesis is that the puppet master leads a double life. The alternate hypothesis is that the puppet master is lazy, which means both these sock puppets are very similar to each other and both of them are very different from the ordinary user. So the puppet master is not putting in a lot of effort uh, to distinguish the sock puppets from each other. So. Uh, by doing uh, the analysis, what we find is that the first hypothesis is wrong and both the sock puppets are very similar to each other uh, uh, statistically. So it is not common for a puppet master to use a good sock puppet account and a bad sock puppet account where good would be uh, one that is indistinguishable from, a, from an ordinary user. So this does not happen a lot. But um, now that we know how, so uh, how puppet masters behave, can we identify how sock puppets are being used? Are they always being used for deception or uh, what are the different purposes? So to do that, we use, uh, we look at usernames of uh, these multiple accounts. So the hypothesis is that deceptive sock puppets will try to uh, prevent um, uh, prevent detection just by looking on whether uh, these accounts are uh, are same. So they will have very different usernames. That's our hypothesis. And let's see if that hypothesis is true. True. So first of all, uh, we look at random pairs of uh, of these sock puppet uh, of these ordinary accounts, which were uh, identified by matching. And what we see is that random pairs usually have. Uh, Usernames that are very different from each other. So Levenstein, uh, Levenstein distance is uh, a very standard uh, measure of how similar two different strings are. And when we look at uh, usernames of two different uh, of two random uh, users, we see that the Levenstein distance uh, peaks at ten and is uh, almost always uh, at least four. But when we look at sock puppet pairs, what we see is that uh, it is bimodal. Some sock puppet pairs have very uh, very similar usernames. Their Levenstein distance is very low, so you cannot uh, so you can just see and uh, uh, look at the username and see that they are the same. And some sock puppets have uh, have very different usernames. So here, for example, if I create two accounts, one Srijan and the other account's name is Srijan two, then these sock puppet uh, the Levenstein distance is uh, one. And anyone, uh, if I make posts from these two accounts, anyone looking at these posts will be able to easily see uh, that these two accounts belong to the uh, belong to the same person. But I, if I create two different accounts, one uh, named Srijan and one named the real Batman, anyone just looking at uh, the usernames will not be able to see that these two accounts belong to the same person. So here, uh, when we divide these sock puppet pairs into two different categories based on how similar their usernames are. So uh, here, when we have sock puppets uh, that do not uh, that have very similar usernames, 
people can look and see that they belong to the same person and they are non pretenders and here when you have uh, usernames that are very different of the two sock puppets they are trying to pretend to be different people and what we see here is that one thirds of the sock puppet pairs are uh, non pretenders while two thirds of the sock puppet pairs are pretenders and uh, the way these pretender sock puppets and non pretender sock puppets are very different from each other is uh, uh, to do that we look at uh, the statistical properties of the posts that these accounts are making and what we see here is that uh, pretender sock puppets are uh, are more opinionated they swear more and they are also downvoted and reported more which means uh, this indicates towards negative behavior of pretender accounts as compared to non pretender accounts um, and uh, looking at whether two sock puppet accounts always support each other or not what we do is uh, we look at pairs of sock puppets when they are replying directly to each other and uh, count the number of assenting negation and dissenting words from luke categories to see uh, what is the sentiment of this particular account this particular comment when replying to the other comment and what we see is that 60% of the times uh, there's no obvious uh, sentiment uh, as expressed by this uh, replying comment and uh, this is uh, usually neutral so 60% of the times sock puppet accounts are uh, neutral towards each other while 30% of the times they are actually uh, uh, they are actually supporting each other surprisingly 10% of the times sock puppet accounts uh, pretend uh, are uh, disagreeing with each other and uh, this is probably to make an illusion of uh, these two accounts being uh, uh, operated by different people and to gain the trust of the other party in the discussion so uh, this is very surprising and uh, if you look at the relationship between uh, between whether the sock puppet accounts are supporting each other and what their user uh, how similar their usernames are uh, what you see is that uh, as uh, essentially as support uh, of the two accounts uh, increases their probability of being uh, of using different uh, username also increases so the red here is for pretenders and uh, you see that as support increases the probability of being a pretender also increases so uh, the take away here is that deception is very important to create an illusion that uh, many different people are supporting my particular cause so now that we know how sock puppet accounts behave and uh, uh, we want to uh, we now want to identify and we now want to detect these different sock puppet accounts and to do that we use uh, different categories of uh, features we have activity features post features and community features where activity is defined based on uh, how many how often and how many um, times a particular account is active and post features are defined based on what the account is actually writing so this is like number of words characters how readable this particular uh, comment is uh, what is the average sentiment how many luke words are there and so on and based on the community you look at uh, how many upwards and downwards these different accounts have gotten and uh, uh, how many times they have these accounts comments have been reported or deleted uh, we do not use any ip based features because that's what we used to define our uh, sock puppets and uh, the first task is given an account can you identify whether the account itself is a sock puppet or a non sock puppet and just by random guessing because we have an equal number of sock puppets and non sock puppets in our data set just by random guessing you would have an area under the rock curve of 0.5 which means essentially a random guess but um, by using post features you get uh, slightly improved uh, 0.57 auc and with activity you get 0.59 but turns out what other people are saying about my particular comment uh, whether they are upvoting downvoting or uh, reporting my per, uh, of uh, reporting the comments made by this user is not very helpful in identifying this per, uh, whether an account is a sock puppet or not when you combine all these features together you get an uh, auc of 0.68 which is considerably higher than all of these uh, uh, individually so the second task we look at is uh, given two accounts do they belong to the same person or not and uh, here using the same set of features what we see is that there's a huge jump between uh, posts 
made by the same uh, when you use post features and when you use activity features there's a huge jump in performance but even now community features are not very important to identify whether two people uh, two accounts belong to the same person and when you combine all these uh, all of these uh, features together you get an area under the rock curve of 0.91 which essentially means almost 9 out of 10 times uh, the algorithm based on these features are uh, very uh, accurate in identifying um, the two accounts together. So overall, uh, in this part, what we saw was uh, these stock puppet accounts may or may not be uh, malicious, um, which means they may sometimes support, the, and they may even sometimes uh, um, no, um, dissent with the other stock puppet account, but most of the times they are, 60% uh, of the times, they are neutral towards each other. And we also see that stock puppet accounts are sometimes uh, deceptive, which means uh, they use different uh, so uh, different usernames, and uh, uh, one third of the time, they do not use different usernames and are not deceptive. So before I move on to the second part of the feature-based algorithms, if you have questions, uh, I am happy to take them. Yes. Right, so uh, what we did was uh, we used uh, IP addresses and we used, uh, um, let me go back to that slide. All right, so this is essentially how we define uh, the SOC Puppet account. So we got this data from, uh, from Discus. So we had uh, non-public information like IP addresses and uh, of uh, all the comments that the user are making uh, on, uh, on this Discus uh, platform. And we used IP addresses and uh, some of their behavior properties to identify, uh, to define the sock puppets. Okay, so it's the same question as detecting a sock puppet is whether it's the same person or not. It's, it's it, uh, yes, so uh, there are no, uh, sadly there were no ground truth labels. So we had to define our own ground truth labels, which we did by using IP addresses. And we did not use IP addresses in the detection task. All right. So your <coughs> sister of the same family could be Hosting, they can be different mm -hmm. people. Yes. They have the same IP. They would have the same IP address, and they uh, are less likely to be uh, posting on the same discussion very close in time, uh, at least three different times. They, that may happen, but uh, with uh, with this definition, we reduce the false positives a lot. So the example that you give of brother systems, you, uh, br brothers and sisters using the same computer and having the same IP address, that may happen, but uh, that happens a lot less as compared to what an ordinary pair of users uh, would get, which have the same property. Okay. Okay. Uh, any more questions? All right, feel free to uh, stop me uh, at any point of time if something is unclear. All right, so uh, the, in the first part, we looked at sock puppets, and now we'll be looking at uh, vandals on Wikipedia. And again, the slides and all the information of the tutorial is uh, in this particular bit.ly uh, uh, bit link. Okay, so if you go on Wikipedia and search what is vandalism, you'd get a definition that says, uh, vandalism is an action involving deliberate uh, destruction or, uh, or damage to public or private property. So the key thing here is that vandalism does not happen by chance. It is deliberate and uh, it, is, uh, it is damaging. And particularly on Wikipedia, uh, it is a very, uh, very easy platform to conduct vandalism because being free, uh, it, um, uh, it is a very attractive platform because being free, it, is, uh, it reaches a lot of people and it is a very major source of information for many. And since anyone can edit it, it is very easy to add information as well as false information on uh, on Wikipedia. And um, in terms of vandalism, uh, Wikipedia defines a vandalism edit as a non-value adding edit, uh, which may be offensive and in general it is uh, destructive and leads to removal. Looking at a couple of examples of vandalism on Wikipedia, someone edited Charlie Sheen's Wikipedia page to say, Charlie Sheen is half man, half cocaine. And uh, some other time, someone edited Emma Stone's uh, Wikipedia page to say, she fell out of the sky as an angel. And that turned, out, uh, turned up in the um, Google uh, uh, smart thingy. 
on the side. So um, uh, in general, 7% uh, of the edits that are made on Wikipedia are vandalism, and 3 to 4% of edits, uh, editors themselves are vandals. And uh, there are several tools to detect vandalism and vandals on Wikipedia. So uh, Sticky is a, uh, is, a, is a tool that is available to Wikipedia volunteers, trusted Wikipedia volunteers, that uh, uses, uh, the tool uses different features to identify, to give a score to each particular edit. Uh, it uses editor features like whether the account is registered or not, how old the account is, uh, what is its location, how many edits it has made in the past and so on. It uses article features like uh, how old this particular article is, what is its popularity, its length and so on. It also uses uh, revision comments and it uses the timestamps of, uh, of this particular edit being made. And based on all of these uh, four different uh, based on all these four different categories, Sticky gives a score to each particular uh, edit. Cluebot NG is uh, currently the state-of-the-art tool uh, that uses textual information based on uh, which uh, which has a Bayesian approach in its uh, in its path. So uh, it uses uh, some information on previously made good edits and vandalism edits, and uh, gives a probability to each word. Uh, of being uh, good and bad and then that is converted into a score and uh, used uh, to identify whether a new edit is uh, is good or bad and uh, essentially a vocabulary is defined and uh, it's actually pretty good in identifying individual vandalism edits um, wiki trust is another such platform that uses uh, the information of how long a particular content survives uh, to give a reputation score to each user and each uh, each edit but vandal uh, these three tools are very efficient in vandalism detection but it turns out vandalism detection is not the same as vandal detection so we did a small study to see uh, how if we use these vandalism detection tools to also identify vandals how accurate we would be and on the x axis is uh, the number of edits that we consider and on the y axis is the accuracy so we have uh, we take 50% uh, vandals and 50% non-vandals and uh, using this uh, rule for sticky saying uh, that an editor is considered to be a vandal if its uh, edit suspicion score exceeds a particular threshold then uh, this user is a vandal so if you have the suspicion score which lies from the range of 0 to 1 if that score exceeds 0 0.1 uh, then you see that even though in the first few edits the accuracy starts uh, um, to be around 0 0.8, it reduces and steadily uh, settles at around 0 0.65. As you increase the threshold, so if now the threshold is 0 0.2, uh, the, the accuracy, accuracy slightly improves. But if you increase the threshold even further, the uh, accuracy uh, of the sticky tool is again around 0 0.65, 0 0.7. Um, so it's not very efficient because uh, with this particular uh, accuracy you'd have a lot of false positives as well as a lot of false negatives and we do not want that so uh, we do not want good edits to be good editors to be banned for uh, vandalism even though uh, because <laughs> even though they were good and uh, we do not want bad editors to still be on wikipedia and uh, do their uh, bad edits if we do a similar study on uh, using Cluebot ng and uh, uh, develop a rule saying an editor is a vandal, if it uh, if it is reverted by Cluebot at least n number of times, where uh, uh, where n is the number of edits and number of reverts that we are considering, uh, the threshold is one, then you see that it has a similar uh, accuracy. And as the reverts are increased, the accuracy uh, decreases, and as you increase it more, it essentially gives a random. Um, description. So both uh, using um, va um, using sticky and using Cluebot to identify vandals instead of vandalism is not very efficient. So what we do, uh, what we want to do is to identify vandals in as few edits as possible. And uh, 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 in our paper published uh, two years ago at KDD, uh, 
we did this analysis using uh, using about 1.5 years of data which had 34000 editors half of which were vandals which were all the edit all the editors that were banned for vandalism during this one and a half years period and in total they made around 770000 edits of which uh, 1.6 uh, 160000 edits were made by vandals so first thing to note is that uh, even though half of these accounts are vandals only 20% of the edits are being made by vandal um, by them and the remaining 80% of the edits are being made by uh, by benign users so uh, to understand how uh, these vandals are actually different from benign users what we do is uh, we look at their characteristics so each user on wikipedia each editor on wikipedia can either edit uh this article page uh, uh, which will be reflected in if you go on wikipedia and search for halifax this is the article page that you'll go uh, that you'll get and you can also go to the stock page and discuss with other editors about what should be uh, what should go in this particular page and what should not uh, go so each editor can either edit article pages or talk pages and what we see here is that uh, comparing edits made by vandals and edit ma edits made by non vandals uh, first of all oh, uh, you see vandals uh, from the very beginning they make most of their edits on uh, on normal wikipedia pages so 90% of the first edits by vandals are on um, um, article pages and it slowly goes down as you consider uh, all the edits that have been made contrast in contrast to benign users they start uh, most of them start by editing non article pages so only 35% of the uh, ed first edits made by uh, benign users are on article pages and on the remaining 65% are on discussion pages and it's slightly uh, it Im increases a lot when you consider the entire lifetime of the user um if you look at uh, how quickly these uh, Ed, uh, editors benign as well as vandal editors are editing these web pages and consider the fraction of edits that are made within 15 uh, 15 minutes of each other and uh, uh, you see that for vandals this fraction is much higher compared to benign users and if you look at re edits made on the same wikipedia page at most 3 minutes apart which is uh, like a very which is a very quick time period you see that uh, again benign vandal users make these re edits very very quickly as compared to benign users um looking at uh, whether vandals uh, even discuss these articles or they are just going to these uh, different article pages and randomly editing uh, to study this uh, we look at how many times a vandal editor or uh, a benign editor edits an article page and then go, goes to its stock page to edit it uh, essentially showing that the art, uh, the editor is involved very much in discussing this particular article what we see is that 11% of the time this uh, only 11% of the vandals do this while 31% of benign users uh, are actually doing that and uh, when uh, to uh, when you look at after this discussion happens they come and re uh, edit this uh, uh, this article page 25% of the benign users do that but only 6% of the vandals do it which essentially means overall benign uh, vandals are not very involved in um, discussion but they rather just go and make random edits on the wikipedia page and they also make a lot of reversion driven edits which means um, a vandal goes to an article page makes an edit that gets reverted by either a human editor or uh, by one of these web um, web tools like cluebot ng or sticky and then the vandal uh, then the editor goes back and edits the same reverted page so that is a reversion driven edit and 35% of vandals actually do that but only 5% of benign users do it and to look at whenever these uh, edits uh, these reverted edits uh, are made whether these uh, are reverted again or whether it is accepted and uh, not deleted we see that for benign editors uh, 90% of the times when they re-edit a page that um, re-edit a page that was uh, reverted by them 
uh, it, uh, that particular revert is uh, uh, that particular edit is accepted which means they have taken in constructive criticism and they have uh, improved the, uh, whatever they had edited and that particular edit is uh, makes sense now and uh, is not reverted anymore and uh, now that we know uh, how benign users and vandal uh, users on wikipedia operate we want to uh, detect them and to do that uh, we develop a lot of features based on uh, a user's history of uh, of its edit so consider a user that makes its first edit on a orange page second edit on a blue page then goes back on the orange page and edits it then goes to two different uh, two that then makes two edits on a green page so what we do is we look at the relation between two consecutive edits that the editor has made in order to define features. So each of these features is a compact representation of the relation between both the edits and both the pages that are being edited. And this is defined based on the time difference between these uh, two edits, the type of the page that is being edited, whether the edit itself is, it's, is a first edit or not, what is the distance between the two edits in uh, oops sorry what is the distance between the two pages that are being edited in the wikipedia hyperlink graph and uh, what is the similarity and uh, whether the edit was reverted or not and what we do is we create uh, these features uh, so we get uh, these pairwise edit features and we represent the user based on that what we also do is look at what is the relation between two consecutive uh, feature vectors. So if you create, if there are n, n different types of, n different categories of features, then you create an n by n matrix and see uh, how many times a particular feature appears after a particular feature. So this is like a meta feature derived uh, from a time series of features. And uh, here you see that feature two appears after feature one, so you put a one here. You see feature one appears after feature two, so you put a one here. And you see feature one after feature, uh, feature four after feature one, so you put a one here. So you get this, uh, this feature transition uh, matrix, which is a meta representation of features themselves. And using these two sets of features, this meta features and uh, this, uh, this pairwise edit features, uh, what we get is that an increase in accuracy of uh, of views, uh, which is this particular uh, com combination of features, uh, compared to Cluebot NG and Sticky, you get uh, around uh, 80, uh, 88 percent of accuracy. And um, looking at uh, how fast uh, this vandalism uh, vandal detection happens, what we see is that uh, views identifies vandals. 80%, 87% of the vandals are accurately identified even before its first reversion, which means even before another human editor or a tool uh, or an automated tool has uh, reverted uh, any of this user's edits, Views has a very high confidence on that the user is actually a vandal. And uh, 44% per, uh, are done before the first reversion and including the edit that was reverted, uh, the, the, edit, uh, the accuracy of this particular thing improves to 87%. Uh, so this essentially shows the, uh, shows the same thing. And on an average, uh, Views is able to identify, uh, identify vandals uh, 2.3 edits, uh, within 2.3 of, uh, of the users. Um, if you include accuracy uh, improves, so uh, this was uh, the number of edits and the average accuracy, and you see, first of all, that uh, the as the number of edits improve, uh, increase the accuracy improves, and when you consider reversion features as well, uh, the accuracy improves even further. Now. Um, the good thing about feature-based uh, feature algorithms is that you can combine as many features as you want and uh, most likely the accuracy will improve and this is what we observe here. When you, when you use fe uh, features from views itself, you get this particular accuracy curve. When you, um, uh, when you include features from views as well as Cluebot, the accuracy improves even further. And when you add in features from Sticky, the, uh, the accuracy gets even, uh, even better. So we have over 90 uh, ninety percent accuracy when you combine features from views, Cluebot, and Sticky. So um, 
essentially this combination of views and clue bot is totally uh, automatic there's no human input uh, involved with sticky there's also human input involved and uh, but it also improves the accuracy a lot more and uh, this is like the uh, optimal system that we would want to create for wikipedia for example and uh, Overall, in this part, what we see is that uh, vandals are mostly making unconstructive edits. They are very fast, they are very aggressive, their edits are reverted more, they don't discuss, and uh, they are uh, uh, easily identified when you combine metadata, text, and human feedback all together. Yes? So, uh, as far as I understand, the technique is based on the observable behavior of the vandals. Yes. Uh, but the behavior is just kind of deceptive because say, in the advanced version of the vandalism, they don't behave that way, and then so your technique will fail to recognize that, That's a great question, and uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, so the way uh, any system, so that's like an adversarial setting. Uh, malicious users do something, a system is created to, uh, to identify that particular behavior and uh, uh, prevent them. And then the malicious users will, uh, will change their behavior again. And this is like a uh, cop and uh, thief uh, uh, thing, right? Uh, both of these behaviors change and adapt as, uh, as, the, uh, uh, as time goes by. So if you don't, uh, if you don't change the uh, detection algorithm, uh, the uh, the vandals will be able to surpass it but if you give it enough time and you retrain the algorithm based on the new data uh, the uh, the adversarial problem goes away because uh, um, let's say you are retraining this algorithm every month or every week or what uh, like at a regular time period then the new detection will be able uh, the newly detected vandals would be able to feed a new information which will be uh, uh, which this particular detection model will be able to capture. Yes. Um, just now you stayed here, and uh, eighty-seven percent and vendors could be and uh, predicted and before the first reward. Here we report represents uh, refers to uh, human reward here or the globus and G. Uh, oh, both. All of them. Both. 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 A any reversion. Okay. Any reversion. Uh, yeah. Are the detected vandals verified manually? Uh, yes. So uh, the uh, on Wikipedia, all the vandals uh, in the study and in general are uh, identified by volunteers and uh, they are banned by administrators, which have uh, power to block users. All right. Uh, so let's move on to the next part, which is the last part of the feature-based uh, algorithms uh, about hoaxes. So um, till now, uh, we looked at two different case studies on uh, malicious user behavior. Now we'll be looking at uh, false information and hoax, excuse me, uh, which is a bit different from how malicious users uh, behave. So now we are in the realm of, uh, for this part, we are in the realm of uh, misinformation. Um, so on the spectrum of false information, on the one side we have misinformation that are honest mistakes, and on the other side we have disinformation that are deliberate lies created to mislead others. And uh, we'll focus on disinformation because uh, they are created deliberately and these are not honest mistakes. And Wikipedia defines hoax, which is a type of disinformation as deliberately fabricated falsehood that it made to masquerade as truth. So there are two important things here. One, it's deliberate. And second, it is made such that it uh, seems, just by looking, it would seem that it is actually genuine. Um, let's uh, look at a few examples. So uh, um, this particular news about Obama signing an executive order that bans national anthem at sports seems very legitimate. It seems to be from uh, ABC News, which is a renowned uh, uh, a standard uh, news agency. It has, it, uh, its layout is good. Uh, it has some views, it has some comments, and so on. But if you look at the URL, it comes from abcnews.com.co, uh, which essentially is uh, trying to simulate, uh, trying to look like ABC dot, abcnews.com, but is actually some other particular domain, and it's very misleading. 
uh, and uh, to counter this there are several different uh, services one of these are snopes that looks at each of these uh, different events that are going on and tries to identify whether that particular uh, news or particular event is actually fake or not so it uh, looks at um, humans actually go and look at each of these different website, uh, these different articles and they have ma um, marked it as fake news. Uh, so this is not scalable of course because uh, it's done manually and uh, of course you need uh, automation to do, uh, we need automation. So to look at a couple of examples of hoaxes particularly on Wikipedia, this is uh, an article called Jar Edo Wins, and it's the it was one of the longest running Wikipedia hoaxes of all times. So it's a very short article, as you can see, two or three lines, and it's about an Australian Aboriginal god who has mystical powers and he will punish you if you do something wrong. Um, this is uh, another article about uh, a, f a fake language somewhere in an island in California where people actually went to study this language only to find that it does not exist and they had to come back. So hoaxes uh, also have real world impact and to look at the um, these properties of misinformation and disinformation, what we see is that um, uh, because people trust news coming from their friends and they do not actually check it, uh, false information goes viral very immediately. Uh, average user does not check it and uh, if we look at a couple of case studies one uh, uh, where uh, uh, one about uh, from uh, 2013 WWW paper on uh, uh, how um, during a hurricane how images and uh, how images were retweeted and tweeted during the first two hours um, uh, this is like the retweet cascade of that particular uh, um, thing. Uh, of that particular image uh, and in this particular one uh, it's by another different study from uh, 2006 and WWW -dub, and what you see here is that again you get uh, a lot of uh, cascades based on uh, false information and uh, from 2014 uh, in uh, ICWSM the study showed that false information cascades run a lot deeper as compared to uh, normal information or uh, genuine information cascade. So here triangle represents false information and what you see here is uh, this is the depth of reshare and uh, this is the fraction of reshares that have a particular depth. So what you see is that false information cascades have a higher probability of uh, cascading for a longer uh, number of times. So the depth of reshare is much, more, much, much higher uh, in general as compared to uh, genuine, uh, genuine information. So um, this very nice study in uh, 2007, uh, in this year's ICWSM looks at uh, what, what is the textual properties of false information and uh, just by looking at uh, at th uh, one of these two news uh, is false. So it turns out that this particular news is actually false. And uh, by doing um, a textual analysis, uh, this paper shows that uh, false information is written in such a way that it, just in the title itself, is a, it has a lot of content. Uh, it has a lot of simple but uh, repetitive uh, words as well, like child and children, pay and play and it uh, makes it more catchy and uh, it has a lot of uh, capital letters uh, it uh, seems to be more uh, um, very very um, uh, 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 catching so um, uh, let's look at a case study specifically on disinformation on wikipedia from uh, www 2016 and uh, first we look at the impact of wikipedia hoaxes and to do that uh, uh, we study the impact in three different dimensions. So Jimmy Wales once said on Quora that the worst hoaxes are those that survive for a long time, receive significant traffic, and are relied upon by credible news media. And uh, we study the impact across these three dimensions. So starting for the first one, uh, on how long a particular Wikipedia hoax lasts. Uh, so here on the x-axis is the time uh, the hoax survives, and on the y-axis is the time uh, 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 is the fraction of articles that are found, uh, fraction of hoax articles that are found. So what we see here is that 90% of the hoax articles are correctly identified within an hour of being 
created, which is a very short period of time. Uh, but 1% of the articles survive for over an year without being detected, and uh, they survive as a hoax. Now, uh, they survive looking like a normal Wikipedia article. Um, they also receive significant traffic. So what we see here is that 10% uh, of the Wikipedia hoaxes get at least 10 page views per day, which is much higher than a normal Wikipedia article, uh, uh, much higher than what a normal Wikipedia article gets. And uh, looking at how people arrive at this particular uh, fake, uh, uh, fake article on Wikipedia, uh, we use Wikipedia's click lock uh, to study what is uh, the domain of the um, uh, domain of the referring link that uh, drives people to this particular Wikipedia article. And what we see is that uh, there are on an average 1.08 in links uh, that were actually clicked and people arrived at uh, this Wikipedia hoax. And uh, these links are from the uh, from everywhere. They are from Google searches, they are from Bing search, they are uh, from social media websites, and they are also from within Wikipedia itself. Um, and the way uh, um, Wikipedia hoaxes exist on uh, exist is by uh, uh, is again by volunteer um, by volunteer work. Um, so volunteers go and identify uh, suspect whether an article is a hoax or not. And once an article is uh, suspected of being a hoax, this particular hoax tag is marked and placed in uh, on on the Wikipedia uh, article. So uh, after that, uh, a thorough study is done on this uh, particular article. And if the article is identified as, uh, as being a hoax, then it is deleted. So uh, in general, hoaxes or uh, false information can edit, uh, can exist in a Wikipedia art, uh, article as entire articles or as uh, hoax facts. But we are looking only as hoax articles because uh, there is this particular hoax tag that gives us a very clean ground truth of over 21,000 hoax articles that were identified uh, over the entire course of existence of Wikipedia. So let's look at what a hoax article goes through from the time it is created. So uh, once the article is created, it is patrolled by Wikipedia volunteers, which uh, essentially means uh, these volunteers have the authority to remove uh, a Wikipedia article or approve it. And uh, they look at the article and uh, uh, if a Wikipedia article pass this patroller, then it survives on Wikipedia like a normal article. So it's uh, it's like a normal web uh, article and you will, if you go on it and don't do your thorough background check, you'll, th uh, you'll see um, that it is, uh, um, it looks like a genuine Wikipedia article. This happens, the article survives like a genuine Wikipedia article, unless, uh, until someone, someone suspects that this article is a hoax and flags it with this particular hoax tag. Then a thorough investigation is done, and if the article is uh, actually a hoax, it is deleted. If not, this uh, hoax tag is removed, and the article uh, comes back in its survival phase. So uh, essentially, if you look at uh, this uh, flagging stage and deletion stage, there are uh, two. There are four different categories of Wikipedia articles in terms of their hoaxness. Uh, there are two types of hoax articles and two types of non-hoax articles. The successful hoaxes are those that have survived the uh, the patrol phase, um, that have passed the patrol phase, survived for over a month are viewed at least 100 times a day during the survival time, but are eventually flagged and deleted. Failed hoaxes are those that were created, but did not even pass the patrol phase. So the article went to a patroller, the patroller was able to identify that this is actually a hoax, the, uh, he or she marked it with the hoax tag and deleted it. So uh, these are the two types of hoax articles. In terms of non-hoax articles, we have two different categories. Legitimate articles are the ones that were created and patrolled but have not yet been flagged. And wrongly flagged articles are those that were created, patrolled, at some point of time, they were uh, flagged as well with the hoax tag. But after investigating, it was found that it's not actually a hoax article and it was uh, eventually not deleted. So it came back to its survival phase. So we, uh, we analyzed these different four types of uh, articles uh, on Wikipedia uh, in terms of these four different categories. 
whether this uh, how the article looks like which are the appearance features uh, how the article connects to other wikipedia articles which are its link features how other wikipedia articles refer to it and what are the properties of the editor uh, itself so uh, starting with the appearance features we look at uh, different properties like what are uh, how long the article is how much actual content it has and how many web and wikipedia links they have uh, per uh, per 100 words of this article and without going into much detail what we see is that hoax articles are in general much longer as compared to non hoax articles but they are also just uh, just a bunch of text and does not have a lot of wikipedia markup and they also have very few wikipedia as well as web links so essentially it's just a bunch of uh, text without much support uh, without uh, much re without much reference if you look at uh, uh, how the article connects to other articles in the wikipedia hyperlink graph so consider this uh, red article it uh, has three hyperlinks to three different wikipedia articles itself and if these wikipedia articles are not connected to each other then the clustering coefficient of this article in the in the local hyperlink graph is uh, is zero and essentially these hyperlinks are incoherent uh, but if there are uh, hyperlinks within uh, these three uh, among these three different uh, articles then the clustering coefficient is higher and uh, these hyperlinks made from this red web page uh, red wikipedia page makes sense and essentially these uh, this article has coherent hyperlinks so comparing the clustering coefficient of wikipedia hoaxes and wikipedia non hoaxes what we find is that legitimate articles are uh, much more coherent as compared to hoax articles which means hoaxes uh, they have fewer uh, fewer wikipedia hyperlinks but these hyperlinks are also just present they do not make sense and they are present just for the sake of adding in more hyperlinks uh, looking at support features what we mean here is that uh, some wikipedia hoaxers what they do is even before creating a hoax article they go and place uh, the um, place a link or a place um, add the title of the wikipedia hoax article in the text of other wikipedia pages so that it seems like there's a need uh, for the article and it actually uh, uh, is a legitimate thing so we call these mentions and uh, what we see here is uh, uh, the number of times these mentions exist and the time between the first mention that uh, when it was placed on wikipedia till the time this hoax article was created and uh, who added this particular um, first mention and what we see here is uh, first of all uh, that uh, hoax mentions are very few in number uh, but whenever they are uh, whenever they are uh, there they are created very close to the creation of the wikipedia uh, uh, hoax article as well as uh, they are created mostly by ip addresses or by article creator uh, itself so here what you see uh, is uh, whether the first mention was created by an ip address or article creator and uh, most of the times these are created by ip addresses that are uh, now in in case of both successful as well as failed hoaxes ip address uh, hoax mentions are a lot while uh, for legitimate articles and wrongly flagged articles the ip address mentions are much lesser um, now finally looking at the characteristics of uh, the person who is create uh, of the account that is creating this hoax article what we see is that uh, the wiki uh, we look at the time between its reg and the account's registration and the time till the article is created and the number of edits that this account has made before creating this wikipedia article what we see is that hoax creators are very recent accounts with much less experience and uh, genuine articles are created by uh, more legitimate uh, uh, accounts so finally looking at uh, detection of uh, uh, at the detection we come back to the uh, this timeline of the article um, we ha we look at multiple different questions the first one is uh, whether whether a hoax will even get past a patroller or not 
and this uh, this question is important to see what are the properties of the patroller uh, of the article that is able to fool the patroller and what patrollers look for when detecting uh, hoaxes and using all the features that we just discussed appearance network uh, support and editor we get an area under the rock curve of 71% with appearance features being the most important features uh, once an article has gotten past the patroller we want to identify whether it is a hoax or not and again we use all the features and we get almost perfect AUC with non-appearance features like more uh, more intricate features like how the article is connected to other Wikipedia articles and what are the properties of the editors these two properties being the most important ones to identify a hoax and uh, this is uh, the change in accuracy as different sets of features are added but uh, uh, but let's skip that and in here uh, after a particular hoax article is flagged uh, after a particular article is flagged we want to identify whether it is actually a hoax or not uh, and this is important because we do not want to wrongly delete genuine articles because whoever contributed and created that article will never come back to contribute more on Wikipedia and we also do not want to wrongly uh, uh, wrongly keep the articles that were not uh, that are actually hoaxes and here uh, we get an area under the rock curve of 86 percent with editor and support features being the most important one so what we see is that in all these different tasks different sets of features are the most important and um, in the more advanced tasks like whether an article is a hoax or whether uh, a flagged article is actually a hoax uh, non-appearance features are more more important and we actually use this particular uh, classifier of whether an article is a hoax or not and we ran it on the entire Wikipedia and our algorithm identified a bunch of hoaxes uh, and we flagged them and Wikipedia administrators actually deleted those. So uh, this, was, this is an example of, uh, of an article titled Steve Myrtle which was, uh, who was supposedly an American popcorn entrepreneur and this article survived on Wikipedia for almost seven years making it one of the longest running Wikipedia hoaxes. So our algorithm identified that and then Wikipedia administrators checked and deleted that. Um, looking at uh, uh, false tweets um, in 2014, uh, they looked at uh, false tweets as well as genuine. Uh, this article looked at uh, <coughs> false tweets as well as genuine tweets, and uh, it got an NDCG score of 75% by using linguistic features, author based features, tweet network features, and time. So, linguistic feature means uh, what is the actual text that is contained in this, uh, uh, in this tweet. Uh, tweet is, uh, author features include how many followers and friends this, art, uh, this author has. Um, tweet network essentially means what is, uh, if you look at the retweet, uh, lead, retweet hypergraph, uh, retweet graph of a particular, uh, uh, of a particular tweet, how many retweets there are, how many mentions, replies, and so on. And in time, uh, essentially means how much time has passed since the author uh, of the original tweet registered and how much time has passed since uh, uh, since the tweet itself. Uh, all right, so okay. uh, how can we identify, can humans actually identify false information? This is like a very important question, especially in the current times when you have uh, so much false information in social media. So the, uh, the suggested way is uh, you should consider the source, you should read beyond just what you are, uh, what you are presented, you should look at who the authors are, uh, what the sources are and so on. So this is like a lot of things to do for a, for a single person and when you're just browsing casually, you won't actually look at the sources or uh, look uh, what, what, is, uh, what lies beyond this particular article itself. Um, so what we did was uh, we did a mechanical Turk experiment where uh, the reader was given two articles. Uh, one was a hoax and one was a non-hoax. The task of the mechanical turkle was to identify just by looking at the article whether it is a hoax or a non-hoax to see what happens to casual browsers, uh, casual users who are just browsing uh, the uh, browsing Wikipedia without actually fact checking. So uh, we created 320 random pairs of hoax and non-hoaxes and we gave each of these pairs to uh, 10 mechanical turk raters. So we got 3200 uh, 3,200 uh, mechanical, 
3200 uh, labels and uh, since uh, we have uh, equal number and uh, you we were showing one hoax and one non hoax if someone was randomly guessing they would get a 50% accuracy but humans get 66% accuracy uh, in identify this hoax article from the non hoax article which is uh, which is decent which means there is hope uh, they are uh, people actually are able to identify hoax articles uh, from non hoax articles but when you use a machine learning classifier uh, based on uh, all the features that we have uh, um, that we looked at this classifier is able to perform much better as compared to humans so essentially casual readers are much more gullible but when uh, when they can be assisted by classifiers by uh, uh, by these systems that are able to identify and tell in real time whether a thing is a hoax or not uh, then it is uh, very important uh, then uh, it performs very well and um, you, just by looking at non appearance uh, just by looking at how the article looks like is not sufficient you have to look beyond uh, just its appearance you have to look at how it connects to other wikipedia articles and how much uh, uh, how often uh, it is referenced by other uh, articles and so on do you have any sense on how much of that was because of the algorithm or because as far as used other features that the humans did yeah so it's like if you gave the classifier the same features that the humans used mm -hmm. the classifier did um actually that's a good question and uh, i don't have the numbers right now but i would uh, if we just do it based on appearance which is uh, um i i guess we would uh, do similar or even worse than humans i don't have the numbers okay. right now but uh, this classifier used appearance as well as non non appearance features which is what helped all right so looking at uh, to understand what actually fooled humans we we looked at hoaxes uh, that the mechanical turkers more uh, very often uh, were able to identify which were easy to identify hoaxes and uh, the hoaxes that were uh, very hard to identify which means humans out of the 10 uh, labelers most of them uh, got it wrong so what we see here is that uh, uh, among all these different properties humans get fooled when an article had uh, more content and it uh, it uh, had more links so essentially when an article looked more genuine humans were able to identify it uh, humans uh, got fooled and were not able to identify the hoax but when uh, uh, this is a very nice study from 2014 at icwsm uh, when you, um, this was based on facebook cascades of uh, false information and uh, uh, so snopes is one of the websites uh, that identifies false information and uh, when when in this uh, information cascade when an article is snoped which means this uh, the link to snopes is placed saying hey this uh, news that is propagating is actually false what happens is uh, in in different uh, when an article is false and it is snoped people actually stop sharing uh, sharing it so essentially when when a false information is identified and pointed out even though people were earlier believing it now uh, by being pointed out people will stop uh, uh, propagating it so overall what we see is that uh, false information can be identified uh, very reliably based on not if you look not just uh, what the article says but also at what other uh, uh, at more intricate features uh, but human and humans get fooled into believing that hoaxes are genuine if they look genuine but it can be uh, but when you point it out humans actually stop uh, uh, propagating this particular false information so this was all for uh, the feature based part, part and uh, i'm happy to take questions for the feature based parts or whatever uh, in the hoaxes one that we discussed if not we'll move on to the second part which is detection algorithms yes so uh, the algorithms are essentially uh, it's just a random forest classifier that takes in this uh, feature vector for each of these different uh, uh, items and classifies it it's it's, uh, it's just feature engineering that's it and it's the same to all three it's uh, so yes so for in this part in the feature based engineering it's uh, it's mostly 
feature engineering and then uh, a standard machine learning classifier logistic regression svms random forest or something or whichever works the best that uh, uh, that is used in, in this part but in the other two parts in spectral uh, algorithms and in density based are actually going to look at the different algorithms but the advantage of feature based engineering is that you get a lot more insight into lots of different uh, behaviors that you cannot get from uh, spectral based or density based algorithms like all the analysis that we do on sock puppets and vandals and about hoaxes you'll not be able to do it uh, if you don't do feature engineering All right. Yes. There's a sense of how long the models uh, stay accurate when things are drifting and need to be trained. That's a good question. We have not done that yet. It's an active. Uh, we'll look at that. It's it's an open challenge. It's uh, it's a very active area of research, and uh, uh, you, you should find out. We we don't know yet. It's uh, it's a very interesting question, like adversarial machine learning and uh, how how often. Uh, you need to retrain. We don't know that yet. Yes. Yeah. In uh, in, in contrast with and windows, it is harder to judge and uh, uh, to judge the hooks and uh, for you you and for human beings. Yes. And in your and for your uh, classifier, how do you get the ground truth? For which part? Uh, for the classifier, maybe it is over eighty percent. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get this ground truth? You need for human it is difficult to judge. Right. So the the ground truth is based on already identified uh, hoaxes or vandals that have been detected. So. Um, uh, if there was uh, the vandals that were identified previously, those are used as uh, as the ground truth for the identification. But if there were smart vandals or smartly written hoaxes that were not yet identified, or they are still on Wikipedia, the, then uh, then that's not in our label. That's not in our ground truth, and we will not be able to uh, get the labels for that yet. Okay, and just uh, you know, just like the data set you can build, and in the views paper, right? Have you built a data set um, for the for the hooks? Yes. Yeah. The the data set is here, and it's publicly available. Yeah, it's it's right here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Have you tried to use a carbon bar to scan all the articles on Wikipedia and find you and help them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we did that, and uh, this was the example for that. This this one, we we found that, and some of them we flagged some of them, and uh, those were deleted from Wikipedia. All right. So let's move to uh, spectral methods, and since we don't have a lot of time, uh, we'll continue that part in the. Uh, we'll continue this part. <coughs> after the break as well. So we have half an hour till the break. And oops. All right. So uh, here, now we are looking at spectral based algorithms. And essentially, uh, the way spectral algorithms work is by uh, matrix factorization of uh, some matrix uh, that uh, uh, that is given to us. For example, uh, one way to do uh, one way to get spectral subspaces is by doing PCA or uh, 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 PCA to get eigenvectors out of an uh, adjacency matrix. For example, so if you have a capital N uh, data points, each of which has n features, then you get its squared covariance matrix, and uh, then you do um, principal component analysis to get its uh, k most important features. Uh, uh, for uh, n features for k subspaces, you do uh, you do PC and you get uh, this particular uh, breakdown. So essentially, you get uh, you divide this C matrix such that uh, um, you you do the PC for that. The other way is uh, to use uh, singular value decomposition, which is what we'll be focusing on in this entire section. And uh, what you do is given a particular matrix, let's say it's called A. We divide it such that 
uh, we have three different uh, matrices. You have U, uh, it's divided into U, which is the left singular ve uh, vector matrix, and V, which is the uh, right singular ve vector matrix, and you get a diagonal matrix uh, sigma. So A, which is the original matrix, is divided into U cross uh, uh, sigma cross uh, V, and each of these uh, different uh, rows, so uh, this, this is n-dimensional, so if this is uh, like an n, it has n users and each of these users have some features, you still have n users which are now represented as uh, each of these users based on their left singular uh, vectors are represented as k-dimensional features and for the um, for uh, each of these uh, from right singular vectors, you get the same thing. So there are lots of different advantages and lots of different use cases of single value decomposition. For example, spectral methods have been used for community detection. So if uh, so, this is uh, from a very long ago paper on uh, how spectral methods are used for uh, for community identification. Uh, and the nodes here are uh, US college football teams and edges are who played with whom. And uh, these communities represent uh, what are the frequently co-playing uh, groups that play uh, uh, very frequently together. Another uh, use case is for anomaly detection, and this is what we'll be focusing, uh, like uh, anomaly detection from using uh, SVDs are, uh, as, are what we'll be focusing on. So the advantage of spectral-based methods are, uh, uh, are several. Um, it, uh, it is very easy to visualize. Uh, you can uh, tune the value of k, which is the number of sp subspaces, and you, you can get uh, lots of different information. Uh, feature uh, extraction um, uh, is not needed. Uh, you, um, just by looking at the leading, uh, feature, uh, leading singular vectors, which are the principal components, you can get uh, the majority information that lies in this particular matrix. And uh, by using... Um, uh, the uh, graphs are everywhere, so you can represent it as n by n graphs or uh, n by n by n tensors, where the last n can be uh, a feature uh, representation as well. And uh, it, it has lots of different applications, including uh, community detection and anomaly detection and so on. So uh, the disadvantage is that, like uh, we saw in feature engineer, feature-based methods, uh, there's no interpretability. We cannot do a lot of... Uh, analysis, we cannot get insights into the behavior, we can, uh, uh, but there are lots of advantages as well. So the first uh, paper we'll, uh, we'll uh, briefly look at is from PAKDD 2010. And the task is, given a social graph that has uh, communicate, uh, that has the information of who calls whom, so users are uh, nodes, the nodes are users and edges are a person calling the other person, uh, can you find color communities? And uh, the task was that, uh, based on a month of data, about uh, 200,000 users and uh, 450,000 calls that were made. And uh, the key contribution of this paper was that they identified uh, spokes, which was uh, very surprising because uh, what, uh, what essentially it means is uh, when singular vectors, uh, either the left singular vectors or right singular vectors, when they were plotted against each other, We'll look at a couple of examples. But when they were plotted against each other, what you saw was spokes which were, uh, which were not really identified before. And uh, so, for example, if you take the right uh, spectral subspace and uh, plot the first, first uh, uh, right singular vector against the right singular vector of the second dimension, you get uh, straight lines uh, representing each node that is uh, import, uh, so each dot, so this is a sequence of dots. You can't really see that, but uh, each dot represents uh, one node. And what you see is that these are uh, perpendicular and uh, axis aligned. So you see that in uh, when you plot the right, spec, uh, right singular vectors of uh, any different uh, importance. So if you plot uh, the ninth one with the tenth one, you also get uh, the right uh, uh, perpendicular vector. So uh, these are uh, these represent essentially cliques or near perfect uh, bipartite cores, representing uh, similar connection between the users them uh, from the users to other users. And uh, um, what you see is uh, if you look at uh, the most important twenty nodes according to the v one vector, which is the right singular vector, or the v two vector. Like, uh, if you look at the most important nodes, 
uh, in, uh, in these nine different vectors and draw the subgraph, you see that they are very densely connected. It's, it's almost a perfect leak in, uh, in most of these cases. So uh, essentially, is pl by plotting the singular vectors, in this case, the right ones against each other, you are able to very accurately identify uh, these dense communities. But uh, they, you see, uh, it, even in this plot, you see a lot of different variations. You get long spokes as well as short spokes. You, uh, you get tilting between these different, uh, uh, different vectors. And uh, the, uh, the idea is like, what, what, uh, what are these different patterns and what is the meaning of uh, these long versus short? So what is the meaning of this tilt? And can, can we ident use this to identify um, these different malicious behaviors? So uh, in a very recent paper by um, Meng Jiang, Peng Chui, Alex Beitel, Christos Falutsos, and uh, Shingi Yang um, from uh, CAIS 2016, uh, they looked at lockstep behavior, which is essentially um, which is essentially a group of users that have similar behavior uh, and performing uh, similar actions. So given a large graph, uh, can we use spectral uh, algorithms to actually infer lockstep behavior? Uh, so consider like a Twitter follower uh, network where users are following other users can, uh, and you have some, some bad users and some normal users where the bad users uh, where uh, you have these services, uh, like uh, you can buy 1,000 followers for only 16 days, and uh, you, you have number of followers were increased by 1,000 within one to two business days. And there are like lots of different services that use these different bots, uh, and, uh, and in several cases, even human accounts uh, to increase your follower numbers. So if you have um, these accounts that are uh, in, uh, increasing your follower accounts, these usually behave in a lockstep, and uh, can you identify them? That is the task. And uh, to prevent detection, what these bots, uh, bots or fake accounts do is uh, they camouflage their behavior, which means they follow not just these customers who have paid for the service, but they also uh, also follow normal users or popular users so that they are uh, they hide their own identity. And also, normal users themselves may not just have followers, these bot followers, they may be followed by normal users as well. Or if, uh, if the account is very popular, they may be followed in general a lot. So uh, if it was just a task where, uh, user, where bots uh, or fake accounts were uh, following users, that would be very easy to do. But with camouflage and, uh, and uh, fame, which means um, users are followed by normal users as well, uh, these two cases make it uh, make it challenging. So, if you have an adjacency matrix where uh, on the x-axis you have users, uh, you have uh, um, who is following, who is following whom. On the y-axis is uh, the incoming one. Uh, if uh, what we need to do is identify a dense block in this adjacency matrix such that these bots are following these customers. But there's also camouflage, which means uh, users, bots are following normal users, and there's fame, which means normal users are uh, being followed by normal users, other normal users as well. So uh, to, uh, to identify these dense blocks uh, or lock steps, uh, it, um, to do that using spectral, uh, spectral methods, what we do uh, is uh, we look at these patterns that will emerge in different cases. So the first case is when there's, uh, there's no lockstep behavior, there's just random, uh, random followers following random people. So if you have a random adjacency matrix, you won't see any particular pattern in spectral subspace. But if you have uh, overlapping dense blocks, what you see here is, uh, let's look at an example. You have uh, 50 followers who are following 50, uh, 50 users, and you have other 50 followers who are following other 50 users. What you get here is uh, if you do, and there's, uh, there's no camouflage and there's no fame, and there may be other users in this adjacency matrix. When you do a spectral decomposition of this matrix and uh, draw the first, uh, uh, first left singular vector against the, first le uh, the second, left, second most important singular vector, uh, which so left uh, singular vectors ident uh, you um, are representing 
the outgoing behavior and right singular vectors always represent the incoming behavior. So here, what you see is that for uh, the 50 bad uh, 50 f uh, users who were giving the ratings appear here. The 50, uh, the 50 blue, uh, 50 blue followers are represented here, while the other users are uh, represented uh, are very close to this particular. Uh, um, uh, uh, they're very close to the zero zero point. So essentially, spokes are formed for uh, in the first left singular vector representing these follower accounts, these bot follower accounts. And when you look at uh, the f the in uh, the right singular vector, um, you get spokes. Uh, you get the spokes as well, and you get who are the customers who have paid for these services, and you get uh, this 50 red f accounts that were being followed and 50 blue accounts that were being followed in here again forming two different spokes. So you get a very nice, uh, just by spectral decomposition, a very standard technique. And just by plotting them, you are able to identify these, uh, these accounts. But this is when the density of follower following is very, very high. And there's no camouflage and no fame. But when the density becomes low, what you see is that spokes still exist, but they are more spread out. They are getting closer to the zero point and both in the left, left uh, subspace and as well as in the right subspace. So you get uh, uh, this particular pattern, the spokes elongate when the density is low. And when there is uh, non-overlapping, uh, when the blocks are still non-overlapping, but there is camouflage or there is fame, so in this case, there is camouflage, uh, there is tilting, which means uh, this spokes are still 90 degree to each other, but they are no longer axis aligned. These, uh, there is a tilt, the spokes still exist, which means uh, the 50 fo uh, red followers are still here, and 50 blue followers are still here, uh, but they are no longer axis aligned. So um, essentially, by camouflaging uh, this, uh, this axis tilts. And when there's no clear, uh, so in this example, these two dense blocks were, uh, were completely disjoint. But when they're not complete, completely disjoint, they are overlapping and uh, they have uh, uh, common users who they are following, you get uh, uh, very interesting behavior. So if you have 1,000 uh, followers, red, blue, and green, if you do the singular value decomposition and uh, plot the left, uh, left singular value the first left singular value and the second left singular value, you get three, uh, three different clusters representing uh, the first red follower, blue followers, which are here, and the green followers, which are here. And if you do the spectral clustering and draw the, uh, the V1 versus V2, which are the right singular vectors, you get six different categories based on six different clusters based on who Oh, sorry, five different clusters based on who is following, who is making these fake followers. So you get E1, which is being followed only by the follow um, by the red followers. You get magenta, E2, which is by both these two followers, and so on. So essentially, this type of scare, staircase patterns leads to these uh, these groups in both the left singular uh, subspace and the right singular vector subspace, which uh, which they call pearls. And uh, the algorithm that is used uh, to identify, so the task is still to identify these fake followers and the customers who have bought these fake, uh, fake followers. The task, uh, the algorithm, uh, what it does is it draws these uh, uh, this UU plots and VV plots and so on and develops a polar, co uh, converts it into polar coordinates. So you have, uh, what you do is you, you Given this, you convert it into r theta, which means r is the distance from the zero zero point, and theta is uh, uh, what is the angle from uh, from this particular line. And each dot here represents uh, the same dot in this particular point. So, a uh, a point which is right here would have a very high value of r, but a very uh, but a zero uh, theta score. 
So you get a spike here, which represents this particular uh, uh, set of points. And the set of points that are represented here are uh, is this spike. So you get two different uh, clear spikes represented uh, in the polar coordinate form. And when you, uh, what they do is uh, they convert this into, uh, they bin this and uh, you get a lot of, uh, you uh, when you draw the histogram from this binning, you get lots of uh, zero, uh, high frequency close to the, uh, with very low value of R. And uh, you get high frequency, uh, a lot of frequency at zero degrees and 90 degrees, which is this frequency and this frequency. So the rays uh, are, uh, uh, are represented as uh, two different spikes. But when you have pearls, which is uh, in this particular complex uh, staircase pattern, you get, uh, you do the same thing and you get uh, the R, R value, which is essentially the distance from the origin that uh, the spikes appear close to the origin as well as uh, very uh, far from the origin and the theta values uh, can be very different as well. Uh, so this was in this uh, four different patterns that we looked at, but uh, and uh, when small scale very stealthy attacks, uh, the uh, so this was a very uh, uh, very easy kind of attack to do and very distinct uh, um, just by uh, doing spectral clustering, spectral uh, decomposition, you are able to identify uh, these different dense blocks. But uh, there may also be stealth users here which are very um, which are very efficient in hiding their own uh, behavior and instead of just following uh, these particular uh, uh, people who have bought the follow uh, who have paid for the follow service they also follow uh, normal users and you may have uh, these uh, very smart users uh, uh, smart fake users so um, for example uh, in this paper from icdm a uh, few years ago um, uh, this is uh, the data set that they used was Twitter follower following network. And uh, with for, for, uh, 41 million nodes and 1.5 billion edges, uh, what they do is uh, they again are using the same uh, singular value decomposition uh, technique where uh, you get this adjacency matrix of capital N by capital N and you divide it into the left singular matrix, the diagonal matrix and the right singular matrix. But uh, the novel idea here is, you, um, ideally, if the transform, uh, if this uh, decomposition is uh, is very efficient, you get uh, if you multiply u with uh, with this uh, sigma matrix, you are uh, you should be able to get the out degree should be represented for all the nodes that are there in the uh, in the network. And when you do, uh, when you multiply V with the sigma matrix, you should be able to reconstruct the in degree of uh, of the user. So for a user I, which is uh, which is reconstructed, the the L2 norm of this particular vector should be its out degree, and the L2 norm uh, in this uh, V V sigma matrix should be its uh, its reconstructed in degree. So uh, the algorithm. Uh, is based on the uh, on the property of SVD that when you have uh, when you represent the um, when you represent uh, uh, the matrix uh, at at k uh, at k size when you uh, even if uh, the sigma matrix is very high and you represent it at uh, at the rank uh, when k equals rank then the vector uh, then the vector length in the original matrix is exactly the same as the reconstructed matrix. But when the value of k is lower than the rank, uh, the intuition for uh, why uh, of uh, this algorithm is when you reconstruct it for uh, k less than rank, this value here, which is the original uh, out degree, is uh, much higher than, uh, um, the, uh, than the reconstructed out degree. And the difference is, uh, is very high for dishonest users. So fraudulent users have very poor reconstruction and honest users have very, uh, very good reconstruction in this uh, singular, uh, in, when the singular matrices are, uh, re, uh, are multiplied and corrected. So uh, uh, let's look at this example. So now for a small value of K, 
you have on the x axis the original out degree and on the y axis the reconstructed out degree and each point here is the number of users that have the same value of out degree and reconstructed out degree so what you see is that these these most of these uh, users are here which means they even though they have uh, uh, decent out degree their reconstructed out degree is much higher than uh, these two blocks of users so these two blocks are important because this says uh, there are a lot of users that have particular out degree but their reconstructed out degree was very very poor and uh, uh, honest users will be here uh, according to this algorithm and dishonest users or fraudulent users uh, will be here and in the lower part of this uh, plot so this was for the out degree if you look at in degree uh, you'll be able to find customers who have paid for the fake for uh, fake users so here you do the same thing but uh, you you put in the in degree and the reconstructed in degree which is uh, which is the l2 norm for a small value of k at uh, of uh, the v uh, v sigma matrix so um, here uh, a couple of examples is uh, uh, if you look at the in degree in degree re in degree reconstructed in degree plot you get uh, users that have very fake uh, looking accounts you get uh, these accounts so um, they have very few tweets they have a lot of following very few followers and they make uh, tweets uh, saying that they um, they represent these following services and the reason this algorithm works is because uh, when you do the spectral clustering and when you have uh, this uh, when you reconstruct it the dishonest users uh, uh, have uh, are projected poorly in the lower uh, lower values of k and uh, therefore uh, their reconstruction is uh, is very uh, very bad but honest users have a lot of projection ev uh, even for the uh, for the higher values of uh, for the low values of k and that is why they are uh, they are very well connected so uh, i won't be starting this particular uh, work we'll be doing that uh, after the break because uh, we are only uh, uh, there's no point starting it right now but uh, i'm happy to take questions till uh, till this particular part or uh, otherwise we can go for the break